In the shadowed world of the unexplained, the men in black are like phantoms emerging from the depths of a noir tale. They arrive in threes, heralding a sense of foreboding that hangs in the air like a dense fog. With a sudden and thunderous knocking, they announce themselves at the doors of those who have dared to peer too closely at the mysteries of the skies. The moment the door swings open, these figures, garbed in the starkness of black, invade the sanctuary of the unsuspecting, their badges gleaming ominously, their words a muddled cacophony of authority and confusion. From the outset, their intent is clear, to sow seeds of turmoil and unease. Their approach is reminiscent of a surreal sting operation, orchestrated by an authority as elusive as it is menacing, with no discernible purpose other than to unsettle and disrupt the lives of their targets. Yet the narrative takes a sudden turn. Once the initial chaos has subsided and the unfortunate host stands bewildered, the men in black deftly steer the conversation towards the otherworldly. Their knowledge is unsettlingly precise, speaking of UFO sightings and clandestine photographs, revealing hidden details unknown even to the observers themselves. In this moment, their purpose begins to crystallize. They are not merely agents of chaos, but bearers of forbidden knowledge, guardians of secrets that skirt the boundaries of human understanding. And then, with a subtlety as chilling as their sudden appearance, they issue their warning, a nebulous yet terrifying threat. Cease speaking of the UFOs, they advise, or face consequences too dire to fathom. Their words, veiled yet unmistakable, leave a lasting imprint, a silent command that echoes long after their departure. Beyond their ominous threats, the men in black weave a narrative of grandeur and necessity, asserting that the silence they demand serves a purpose greater than the individual. It is for the good of the country, the welfare of the world, and, in their most grandiose claims, for the benefit of the universe. Researchers and those who have faced these visitors started to observe details that set the men in black apart from any typical government agent. Their appearance, upon scrutiny, often revealed unsettling, almost inhuman traits. The more one delved into their encounters, the more one found oneself questioning not just their origins, but the very nature of their existence. The eerie characteristics of the men in black further distance them from the realm of the ordinary. Witnesses report their skin as having an unnatural sheen, akin to plastic or rubber, devoid of any imperfections found in human skin. This artificial appearance extends to their lack of body hair. Not only are they bald, but their faces are completely devoid of hair, lacking even eyebrows, enhancing their mannequin-like demeanor. Their behavior, too, is consistently described as odd and mechanical. Their movements are reported as awkward and uncoordinated, as if they are not fully accustomed to navigating in human form. This uncanny valley effect is compounded by their difficulties in basic human interaction. Their speech is often peppered with anomalies, misuse of common phrases, and their body language is disjointed and unnerving. The unsettling nature of the men in black was particularly evident in the first documented encounter. Harold A. Dahl, a fisherman, experienced a chilling event that would set the tone for future MIB encounters. While on his boat with his son and their dog, Dahl witnessed a surreal sight. Six bizarre, unidentified crafts hovering overhead. In a moment that seemed ripped from the pages of a science fiction novel, one of the crafts discharged a substance resembling molten lava, tragically killing his dog and causing severe burns to Dahl and his son, necessitating hospitalization. Despite the traumatic nature of this event, Dahl displayed remarkable fortitude. He managed to collect samples of the strange slag that had solidified on his boat, a tangible piece of evidence from an otherwise unbelievable encounter. This incident not only highlights the mysterious nature of the men in black and their associated phenomena, but also marks the beginning of a series of bewildering experiences that challenge our understanding of reality. 
Soon after securing this evidence, Dahl's world took a turn towards the surreal. The ominous knock at his door heralded the arrival of a figure dressed entirely in black. The visitor stood before Dahl, an incongruous presence in the mundane setting of his doorway. Yet, despite appearing out of place, the man exuded an aura of daunting authority, his demand sharp and unyielding. Dahl was to erase from memory all that he had witnessed. The encounter with this figure marked the beginning of a series of visits, each one intensifying the sense of unease and compulsion. With every visit, the man in Black's strange influence grew stronger. He couldn't ascertain the identity of this mysterious visitor, yet felt an overwhelming pressure to heed his commands. The persuasion of the man in black was not just strange. It was overpowering, compelling Dahl to question the very nature of his experience and pushing him towards a reluctant compliance with the will of his visitor. In the annals of Men in Black law, the story of Albert Bender stands as a seminal chapter perhaps the very catalyst for the public's awareness of these mysterious figures. Bender, a modest office clerk with a history in the military, was an unassuming figure, unlikely to become the centerpiece of one of the most intriguing mysteries of the era. Post-World War II, his life was unremarkable. His days spent under the roof of his stepfather's attic, a space that belied the extraordinary turn his life was about to take. In this unassuming setting, Bender's fascination with the unknown catalyzed the birth of a significant movement in the UFO community. Albert Bender's International Flying Saucer Bureau and its publication, The Space Review, gained unprecedented popularity, a phenomenon we would liken today to going viral. His work struck a chord with enthusiasts and witnesses of unexplained aerial phenomena, turning his humble attic into a hub of extraterrestrial investigation and speculation. Yet the burgeoning success of the IFSB was short-lived. Mere months after its meteoric rise, a visit from the Men in Black marked the beginning of a series of bizarre and unsettling events that would lead to its abrupt closure. The first of these incidents unfolded in the seeming normalcy of Bender's home. Alone in the house, Bender was about to engage in the mundane act of answering a phone call. As Bender lifted the receiver to his ear, the atmosphere shifted palpably. A chill, sudden and unexplainable, coursed through him. An ominous prelude to the eerie silence that greeted his repeated hellos. No voice answered back, yet the air was heavy with the presence of an unseen listener, a silent observer on the other end of the line. This unnerving experience was just the beginning, an overture to a symphony of bizarre occurrences that Bender would soon find himself enmeshed in. The unsettling silence on the other end of the phone line left Bender reeling, a dizziness overwhelming him as he abruptly ended the call. Driven by a sense of disorientation, he retreated to the sanctuary of his bed, succumbing to a restless and uneasy slumber. This peculiar episode, while disconcerting, was momentarily pushed to the back of his mind, overshadowed by the day-to-day -day demands of managing the IFSB. Yet, this strange encounter was not to be an isolated event in Bender's increasingly surreal life. Seeking a respite from his responsibilities, Bender later found himself in the familiar confines of his local cinema, a haven where he often sought solace and clarity. The film that evening, typical of the era's B-movie science fiction fair, failed to capture his attention, its plot and characters fading into the background of his preoccupied mind. As the movie drew to its conclusion, Bender embarked on his journey home. It was past midnight and the city streets lay quiet and desolate, bathed in the dim glow of streetlights. His senses heightened by the late hour, Bender was vigilant for the commonplace threat of muggers. However, as he navigated the silent streets, a more ambiguous and ominous presence began to make itself felt. This was no ordinary pursuer, a nebulous presence that seemed to drift at the periphery of his awareness, transforming his solitary walk into a journey fraught with unease and foreboding. Beneath a watchful moon, Bender hastened to the modest house he called home, 
Silently, he locked the door behind him, creeping upstairs to avoid waking his stepfather. In his attic room, a startling scene awaited him. A foul scent of burning sulfur filled the air, and before him floated a glowing orb. Such orbs were said to be anything from spirits to alien surveillance devices. Heart pounding, he stood face to face with the orb. In a reflexive attempt to confront the unknown, Bender reached for the switch, flooding the room with light. The instant the overhead bulb cast its glow, the mysterious orb vanished, as if it were a mere figment of the shadows. Confusion reigned in Bender's mind. Was this an illusion, a trick played by weary eyes or an overwrought mind? The questions multiplied, yet no answers presented themselves. As Bender's gaze swept over his attic, the reality of the situation began to assert itself. The room, usually a haven of order and research, was in disarray. His carefully curated files, the heart of his work with the IFSB, lay strewn across the floor, in chaotic abandon. It appeared as though an invisible intruder had rifled through them with an urgent, frantic need. The connection between this disarray and the fleeting presence of the orb was undeniable. Bender found himself grappling with a mystery that seemed to deepen with each passing moment. How could this unexplained orb have such a tangible impact on his physical surroundings? What was the purpose of this intrusion? And what, if anything, was the entity searching for among his collection of UFO files? Bender once again found solace in the familiar environment of his local cinema. In November of 1952, he settled into the dimly lit theater, hoping to lose himself in the world of science fiction. However, relaxation proved elusive. Amidst the flickering images on the screen, Bender became acutely aware of a sensation familiar to many. The unsettling feeling of being watched, scanning the sparse audience and the encompassing darkness, he found no obvious source for this unnerving feeling. The mystery deepened when, out of the corner of his eye, Bender noticed a startling change. An empty seat beside him, previously unoccupied, was now filled by a diminutive figure. Clad in a long black trench coat and a fedora hat, his appearance was strikingly out of place. But it was his eyes that truly set him apart. They glowed with an unnatural intensity in the dim light of the theatre, casting an otherworldly aura around him. This encounter overwhelmed Bender with a visceral sense of unease. Nausea gripped him as the room seemed to spin, a physical reaction to the surreal presence beside him. In a desperate attempt to regain his composure, Bender closed his eyes, hoping to dispel the unsettling sight. When he reopened them, the mysterious figure had vanished, leaving no trace of his ever being there. Bender's mind raced to find a logical explanation. Perhaps the man had simply left to fetch popcorn. In those brief seconds his eyes were closed. Or maybe it was all an optical illusion, a trick of light and shadow in the cinema. These rationalizations, however, did little to quell his rising anxiety. The feeling of being watched, so acute and disconcerting, returned with renewed intensity, compelling him once more to scan his surroundings. The repeated sensations of surveillance and the surreal encounters with the men in black were taking a toll on Bender, leaving him in a state of constant alertness and apprehension. Each episode seemed to blur the lines between reality and the unknown, drawing him deeper into a world shrouded in mystery and intrigue. The unsettling sensation of being watched that had haunted Bender throughout the evening reached a chilling crescendo when he turned to confront it. To his dismay, he found himself face to face with the same mysterious man in black, seated directly behind him. The man's demeanor was more than just unsettling, it radiated hostility, his gaze fixed on Bender with an intensity that conveyed both anger and contempt. This encounter, more direct and menacing than any before, shattered the last vestiges of Bender's composure. Feeling thoroughly unnerved and overwhelmed by the situation, Bender made the decision to leave the theater immediately, seeking refuge in the familiarity and safety of his stepfather's house. However, this incident in the cinema was not an isolated event, but rather a prelude to a series of strange encounters with the men in black that would continue to plague him in the ensuing months. 
It was not until the men in black chose to formally reveal themselves that Bender would begin to understand the true nature of the figures that had so dramatically entered his life. Contact Day marked a pivotal moment in Albert Bender's journey into the world of UFOs and the men in black. Despite the unnerving experiences that had become a staple of his life, Bender's fascination with the unknown propelled him to orchestrate an event that was as ambitious as it was unconventional. He proposed a bold experiment, rooted in the belief that telepathic communication might bridge the seemingly insurmountable gap between humans and extraterrestrials. This idea, tinged with the flavor of New Age thinking, was not without its skeptics, even among Bender's closest associates. The notion of gathering his followers to simultaneously focus their thoughts towards contacting extraterrestrial beings through mental mantras seemed like a leap into the realm of fantasy. However, Bender's conviction in the power of collective telepathy was unshakable. He theorized that if enough people concentrated their mental energy on making contact with UFO occupants, who he believed were capable of telepathic communication, they might just receive a response. Despite objections from two board members who dismissed the idea as fanciful, Bender's enthusiasm and determination won out. The plan for contact day was set into motion, marking a bold step in his quest for answers in the world of UFO phenomena. Albert Bender's ambitious initiative for contact day was meticulously planned and communicated through a special bulletin issued in the Space Review and other IFSB publications. His goal was to orchestrate a synchronized global effort of mental telepathy, targeting the occupants of unidentified flying objects. The bulletin outlined the details of this unique experiment, serving as a guide for all participants. It called upon every officer, representative and member of the IFSB to join in this collective telepathic effort. The instructions were clear and specific. Each participant was to memorize a prepared message find a quiet and secluded spot, and at a designated time, close their eyes, ideally lying down, to focus their thoughts on transmitting this message through mental telepathy. The message began with a direct appeal, calling out to the occupants of interplanetary craft who were believed to be observing Earth. It established a tone of friendship and goodwill, extending an invitation for these extraterrestrial beings to make their presence known on Earth. Bender's words conveyed a sense of unity and a desire for mutual understanding between humans and the extraterrestrial entities. He emphasized the peaceful nature of this request, asking for a sign of acknowledgement, a gesture that would bridge the gap between Earth and the unknown visitors. It expressed a profound hope that, through this collective telepathic effort, a new chapter of human-extraterrestrial interaction could begin, marked by peace and mutual understanding. On the appointed day, Bender, true to his mission, prepared himself for the experiment. As the clock struck 6 p.m., he set the stage in his attic, a place that had become a sanctuary for his quest into the unknown. Dimming the lights, he lay down and began the mental recitation of the message he had so carefully composed. His commitment to the cause was unwavering, his focus absolute. However, Bender's experience during this exercise was far from what he had anticipated. On the third repetition of the message, the atmosphere in the room shifted dramatically. The temperature dropped, sending chills down his spine, an ominous sign that something extraordinary was occurring. This physical manifestation was accompanied by an intense headache, akin to the pounding of a sledgehammer, and the unsettling scent of sulfur filled the air. These disturbing sensations suggested a response from an entity that was perhaps not as benevolent as Bender had hoped. His attempt to understand their apparent hostility only yielded a cryptic and cold response. The voice claimed a special assignment on Earth, one that could not afford the disturbances caused by human curiosity, particularly by individuals like Bender, the final words of the entity were as chilling as they were mysterious, a stark reminder of their omnipresent watch over humanity. Bender's return to his physical body was marked by a fleeting glimpse of a shadowy figure, 
embodying the men in black, before it disappeared, leaving him in a state of solitude, confusion and fear. This momentary vision, whether real or imagined, compounded the surreal nature of his experience. In the days following this encounter, Bender found himself grappling with its aftermath, both mentally and physically. The experience was more than just a disturbing dream, it had a tangible impact on his well-being. He suffered from nausea, physical illness, insomnia, and an overwhelming lethargy, as if his very essence had been drained. Albert Bender's experience left him in a quandary. Confronted with an event that defied conventional understanding, he grappled with the dilemma of sharing his encounter. The fear of disbelief and ridicule weighed heavily on him, especially given the already controversial nature of his work in ufology. Bender was acutely aware that his story, teetering on the edge of the unbelievable, could further marginalize him in the eyes of skeptics and detractors. Seeking a middle ground, Bender chose to document his experience in meticulous detail, preserving it in an unmarked letter. He secured this precious document in his combination safe, a vault for his valuables, and now, his most unsettling secrets. Bender pondered over the future of this account. Publishing it in the Space Review could bring his experience to light, possibly attracting the attention and understanding of others who had similar encounters. Alternatively, sending the information to US government officials might serve as a warning or a plea for investigation into these mysterious occurrences. The decision was difficult, but Bender leaned towards publication, hoping to contribute to the larger narrative of extraterrestrial encounters. However, when Bender finally opened his safe to retrieve the letter, the letter had vanished, leaving behind only the unmistakable scent of sulfur, a sensory echo of his previous encounter. The mystery continued to unfold when Bender experienced a similar dream a few weeks later, echoing the events of Contact Day. In this haunting recurrence of his previous experience, Bender once again found himself in an altered state of consciousness, seemingly detached from his physical form and immersed in an environment of flashing blue lights. This time, however, his experience took on a more direct and discernible form. Within the confines of his attic, Bender perceived the presence of three figures emerging from the shadows, their attire unmistakably reminiscent of the men in black, complete with fedoras that lent them an almost clerical appearance. Amidst this surreal tableau, a voice resonated within Bender's mind. It acknowledged Bender's dedicated and sincere efforts in unraveling the mysteries of UFOs, yet it carried an undercurrent of warning. The voice suggested that his deep involvement in these matters might lead to unintended and possibly harmful consequences. The communication went further, intriguingly identifying Bender as a valuable contact on Earth. They recognized him as an average person, a strategic choice for their purposes, as the extraordinary nature of what he was shown and told would likely be met with disbelief if he attempted to share it with others. The men in black elucidated their ability to shapeshift, a startling capability that allowed them to assume human form and blend seamlessly into society. This admission shed light on their covert operations and the lengths they went to in order to remain undetected. The visitors disclosed the extent of their interventions on Earth, revealing their use of craft from their own base and their deliberate actions to maintain secrecy, even when these actions had dire consequences for humans. The admission of using human bodies as disguises was particularly chilling suggesting a complex and morally ambiguous agenda. Yet, in a twist, the men in black expressed a desire to maintain communication with Bender. They foresaw him as a chronicler of their existence and activities, a role that would leave him enlightened yet isolated in his knowledge. They predicted that his accounts would be met with skepticism, positioning him as a solitary bearer of profound truths about extraterrestrial life and the future of humanity. The visitors concluded by setting the terms of their future interactions with Bender, instructing him to refer to them as numbers 1, 2 and 3. This depersonalization further added to their mystique, 
making them not just elusive in identity, but also in intent. Bender was left with a conundrum, privy to extraordinary information, yet bound by the paradox of knowing truths that would be dismissed by the broader world. The Men in Black's parting gift, a small piece of metal akin to earthly coins, materialized in Bender's hand as he awoke. This object, cold and enigmatic, served as a bridge between the surreal experience he had just undergone and the physical world he inhabited. It stood as a stark reminder that the boundaries between the dreamlike and the real might be more porous than previously imagined. This profound experience marked a turning point in Bender's life and his involvement with UFO research. To those within the IFSB, Bender had always been at the forefront of the quest for answers, a passionate advocate for unveiling the truth behind UFOs. His sudden silence and withdrawal from the topic therefore came as a shock. Gray Barker, a writer, journalist, and close associate of Bender's within the IFSB, witnessed this dramatic change. From an ardent investigator and communicator on UFO matters, Bender transformed into a withdrawn figure, distancing himself from the very subject that had consumed much of his life. Bender informed his colleagues and followers that he had been visited by three authoritative figures who had persuaded him to cease his activities and shut down the IFSB. The lack of detailed explanation from Bender only fueled speculation and concern. His resignation from the head of the IFSB was not just a personal decision, it was a symbol of the profound impact his encounters had on his life and his view of the UFO phenomenon. Bender's transition from a fervent UFO researcher to a silent observer raised many questions about the nature of his experiences and the entities he had interacted with. It highlighted the powerful, perhaps even coercive influence these encounters had on individuals deeply involved in UFO research. Gray Barker's response to Albert Bender's abrupt withdrawal from UFO research was one of deep concern and intrigue. Motivated by the mysterious circumstances surrounding the end of the IFSB, Barker delved into his own investigation. His efforts culminated in the book They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, which would become a seminal work in UFO conspiracy theories. In his book, Barker introduced the idea of a covert organization dedicated to suppressing serious UFO investigations. He proposed that individuals who came too close to uncovering the truth about UFOs were systematically silenced by the enigmatic men in black. His theory extended beyond mere intimidation. He speculated on the possible involvement and knowledge of the US government in the UFO phenomenon. Barker's focus then shifted to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, linking his administration to these clandestine activities. This was during Eisenhower's first term in the mid-1950s, a period rife with Cold War tensions and nuclear arms concerns. Barker's musings coincided with one of the most enduring alien conspiracy theories, that Eisenhower secretly negotiated a treaty with extraterrestrial beings during this time. He postulated that Eisenhower's military background and his public statements hinted at a deeper knowledge of extraterrestrial matters and their implications for world peace. However, Barker's speculative journey took an even more personal turn when he himself reportedly had an encounter with the Men in Black. This individual, appearing at Barker's office with one of Barker's own business cards, inquired about its connection to a man admitted to a hospital. The business card, which identified Barker as the chief investigator for the IFSB, led the mysterious visitor to Barker. The brief exchange ended with the visitor leaving as abruptly as he had arrived. Gray Barker's unsettling encounter with the men in black took a turn towards the inexplicable when he realized the improbability of the visitor's story. The business cards in question had been printed only days earlier, making it highly unlikely for an unidentified hospital patient to possess one. 
This realization cast the entire encounter in a suspicious light, reinforcing Barker's belief in a covert effort to monitor and possibly intimidate those involved in UFO research. Despite the shutdown of the US branch of the International Flying Saucer Bureau, its international counterparts in the UK and Australia continued their investigations. It was then that Edgar Jarold, the director of the Australian branch and a committed UFO investigator, found himself under the scrutiny of the men in black. The regular appearance of a black Cadillac outside his office, an anomaly in his routine environment, marked the beginning of his own unsettling experiences. The presence of the car, coupled with the sighting of two strange men in black sitting inside it, Gerald's sense of being watched was palpable every time he glanced out his window. This strange vigil outside his office soon escalated to mysterious phone calls, which Gerald instinctively linked to the men in the Cadillac. In a bizarre twist, Gerald's experiences took on a supernatural dimension with the onset of poltergeist activity, a form of harassment that defied logical explanation. This progression from being surveilled to experiencing unexplainable phenomena suggested that the methods employed by the entities associated with the men in black were not just confined to physical intimidation, but extended into more esoteric forms of disturbance. Gerald's experiences mirrored those of Bender and others who had delved deep into UFO research. The unsettling experiences of Edgar Gerald in the wake of Albert Bender's resignation from the IFSB were characteristic of what would later be described by John Keel as high strangeness. Gerald's life was disrupted by a series of paranormal occurrences, unexplained knocking sounds, the mysterious displacement of household items, and an escalation to physical violence when he was pushed down a flight of stairs in a busy department store. Following this harrowing episode, Gerald, like Bender, felt compelled to step back from his involvement with the IFSB, marking another success in the alleged campaign of the Men in Black. Gray Barker, initially a supporter of Bender's accounts, later expressed skepticism about the paranormal nature of the Men in Black, leaning towards the theory that they were government agents. However, the global span of similar experiences, such as Gerald's in Australia, suggested that the phenomenon might transcend any earthly agency. The mysterious nature of the men in black continued to perplex those who encountered them. Were they aliens in human guise or humans posing as extraterrestrial beings? This ambiguity was further exemplified in the experience of Cynthia Appleton, a British housewife with no prior interest in the paranormal. Her encounter began with an overwhelming sense of oppression, followed by an intense illumination in her home and a period of missing time. This incident, which left her with an hour-long gap in her memory, added to the growing collection of bewildering experiences associated with UFO phenomena. Returning to the nursery to check on her child, she was captivated by the unusual rosy hue of the sky, only to be overtaken once again by the same intense oppressive sensation she had felt days earlier. This time, the experience intensified, marked by a high-pitched humming that seemed to resonate from every direction, escalating to a point where it felt almost physically unbearable. Then abruptly it ceased, leaving Cynthia in a state of shock and confusion. A strange haze materialized before her, fluctuating and distorting like a malfunctioning television screen until it abruptly snapped into clarity, revealing a holographic projection of a humanoid figure. The being, reminiscent of a human in appearance but wearing a spacesuit similar to those of NASA astronauts, was an anachronism given that the encounter predated the Apollo missions. Cynthia's initial terror was quickly alleviated by the being's repetitive mental instructions to not be afraid, a technique that effectively calmed her. Her visitor, initially appearing as a holographic projection from the planet Garnasvan, later manifested in a more traditionally earthly guise. The transformation from a friendly Nordic-looking spaceman to a figure resembling the men in black 
marked a significant shift in the nature of her encounters. The arrival of the being, along with two companions in a black Cadillac typical of MIB sightings, directly at Cynthia's doorstep, bridged the gap between otherworldly encounters and the more terrestrial mystery of the men in black. From February to August 1958, Cynthia's encounters with these beings assumed a distinctly MIB-like quality. They interacted with her in a manner akin to physical human beings, yet their actions and characteristics belied their true nature. One such instance was when one of the MIB showed Cynthia a burn injury. Contrary to human medical practices, the being used a gel from a toothpaste-like tube for instant healing, leaving behind a piece of his skin in the process. This physical evidence was an extraordinary development. Cynthia's account of the healing process and the leftover skin sample provided a rare opportunity for scientific analysis of what was otherwise a largely anecdotal field. The skin sample was subjected to laboratory examination using the best available technology. The analysis of the skin sample left behind found that the skin was somewhat akin to animal tissue, particularly that of a pig yet not entirely human or alien, propelled various theories. The notion that it might be lab-grown tissue, especially in light of later discoveries about the genetic similarities between pigs and humans, suggested a level of technological sophistication far beyond known human capabilities at the time. This revelation led to the speculation that the men in black could be clones or artificially created beings, possibly engineered for specific purposes. Such a theory aligned with the unusual characteristics and behaviors often attributed to the MIB. However, as with many elements of UFO phenomena, there remained a counter-argument, the possibility that the story and the evidence could be fabricated, casting doubt on the authenticity of the encounter. Cynthia Appleton's experiences with the men in black significantly diverged from the more typical narratives associated with these figures. Unlike most MIB encounters that follow a UFO sighting and aim to silence witnesses, her interactions were characterized by a degree of openness and even revelation. The MIB in her case seemed intent on sharing information about their origins and technology as evidenced by the holographic displays of spacecraft. These peculiarities in her account only deepened the mystery surrounding the motivations and objectives of the men in black. Were they agents of disinformation, cosmic tricksters playing an elaborate game with humanity, or something else entirely? The ambiguity of their intentions and the disparate nature of their appearances across different accounts left more questions than answers. The photograph known as the Solway Firth Spaceman is a famous and intriguing piece of folklore. Taken in 1964 by Jim Templeton near Solway Firth, it appears to show a figure in the background resembling a spaceman, which Templeton insisted was not present when he took the photograph. The image gained significant attention and various theories were proposed, ranging from extraterrestrial visitors to secret military experiments. One of the most notable aspects of this story is the purported interest from NASA. According to Templeton, he was contacted by two men who claimed to be government agents, asking questions about the photograph. Additionally, he reported that NASA had contacted him, curious about the photograph due to its similarity to an incident during a space mission. However, there's no concrete evidence that NASA was directly involved in investigating this photograph. The mystery was later explained as a likely case of perceptual illusion. The spaceman figure is most commonly believed to be Templeton's wife, Annie, who was present at the time, accidentally captured in the background and overexposed due to the conditions of the shot. Her light blue dress could have appeared white in the overexposed image, making it resemble a spacesuit. This explanation, while widely accepted, doesn't entirely dispel the mystery for some enthusiasts. The Solway Firth Spaceman remains a popular topic in discussions of unexplained phenomena, illustrating how a combination of unusual circumstances and perceptual tricks can create an enduring mystery. In Jim Templeton's case, 
The appearance of these men, as reported, follows a familiar pattern often recounted in UFO-related stories. The arrival of unknown individuals showing a keen interest in an unexplained phenomenon, followed by an intimidating interaction. The demand that Templeton take them to the exact location where the photo was taken is characteristic of such stories. While the MIB narrative is compelling and adds an element of conspiracy to the story, it's important to approach such claims critically. Much of the evidence around such encounters is anecdotal and not verifiable, which makes it difficult to establish the truth behind these claims. Critics argue that such stories are either hoaxes, the product of imaginative storytelling, or misinterpretations of encounters with government or military officials. It's important to consider that while these stories are compelling and have become a part of popular culture, there is little to no verifiable evidence to support the existence of the men in black as they are portrayed in UFO mythology. Rex Heflin's encounter on August 3, 1965 stands out as one of the more intriguing episodes in the annals of UFO sightings particularly due to the photographic evidence he captured. Working as a highway inspector in Orange County, California, Heflin's primary concern on that day was a mundane one, a tree obstructing a railroad crossing sign. However, an unexpected turn of events shifted his focus from terrestrial to extraterrestrial matters. The silence on his radio, initially assumed to be a technical glitch, coincided with Heflin's sighting of an unidentified flying object. The proximity of the craft, coupled with its silent movement, was enough to capture his full attention. His quick thinking led him to photograph the object, resulting in some of the clearest images of a UFO from that era. The photographs reportedly showed intricate details of the craft's machinery and a searchlight illuminating the road below features difficult to fabricate with the technology available in 1965. Heflin's interpretation of his encounter was pragmatic. He suspected the craft to be a secret military aircraft rather than an extraterrestrial spaceship. This view, however, was not shared by his friends, one of whom was so impressed by the photographs that he convinced Heflin to share them with the local media. Once the photos entered the public domain, Heflin found himself at the center of a whirlwind of attention. UFO enthusiasts and researchers were eager to learn more about his encounter, viewing his photographs as significant evidence in support of UFO existence. However, the interest wasn't limited to civilian UFO groups. Military officials also approached Heflin, possibly to determine if the craft was a confidential military project. Rex Heflin's interactions following his UFO sighting and the release of his photographs took a turn with the involvement of an individual claiming to be from NORAD. This person, adorned in the typical dark suit associated with the men in black, presented a badge that appeared quasi-official, requesting to borrow Heflin's UFO photos for further examination. Trusting in the apparent legitimacy of the request, especially given his previous experiences of lending the photos to military authorities, Heflin complied. However, the situation became suspicious when Heflin's attempts to retrieve his photographs were met with the revelation that NORAD had never sent a representative to him. This discovery led to the unsettling realization that he had been deceived by an imposter. The question of the imposter's identity and motive became a matter of intrigue, not just for Heflin, but also for various branches of the US military and intelligence agencies. This incident, along with others, prompted official investigations into the impersonation of military officers, as evidenced by documents revealed through the Freedom of Information Act. A notable memo from Lieutenant General Hewitt Wheelis, dated March 1, 1967, highlighted the concern within the Air Force regarding individuals posing as NORAD agents or Air Force personnel in relation to UFO sightings. The memo not only referenced Heflin's encounter with the MIB imposter, but also detailed another case where an individual, dressed in dark Air Force attire, actively discouraged witnesses and law enforcement from discussing their UFO sightings.
These incidents indicated a concerted effort by unknown entities to control the narrative around UFO encounters. The memo underscored the seriousness with which these incidents were taken. The directive to report any such activities to the Office of Special Investigations, OSI, indicated a concerted effort to uncover the truth behind these mysterious figures. In the midst of this growing intrigue, the University of Colorado, under the leadership of Dr. Edward Condon, embarked on the Condon Report, a comprehensive study aimed at analyzing the most credible UFO sightings and incidents, including those investigated under Project Blue Book. Rex Heflin's sighting and subsequent encounters with the MIB were among the cases examined in this report. Robert Lowe, the report coordinator, regarded Heflin's case as one of the most significant in the study, highlighting its importance in the ongoing effort to understand the UFO phenomenon. However, the attention drawn to Heflin's case seemed to have also caught the eye of the MIB. During the Condon Report's investigation, Heflin experienced a second visit from these figures. This encounter was marked by the arrival of a pitch-black vehicle with a peculiar glow, from which two men in Air Force uniforms emerged. These individuals, presumed to be MIB imposters, aggressively questioned Heflin about recent UFO sightings and, intriguingly, broached the subject of disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. Rex Heflin's second encounter with individuals claiming to be from the Air Force, who were likely men in black imposters, brought an added layer of peculiar and unsettling elements. As soon as these men entered his house, the atmosphere changed tangibly. The demeanor of these men was notably aggressive, creating an air of implicit threat despite the absence of direct intimidation. Their fixation on discussing unrelated UFO sightings in an animated and seemingly agitated manner was not only odd, but also disconcerting. Their presence and behavior in Heflin's home, described as akin to two agitated adults, fervently discussing UFOs with raised voices and emphatic gestures, Heflin attempted to assert some control over the situation by demanding the full names and ranks of these individuals. Remarkably, they complied with his request. However, the authenticity of the information they provided was cast into doubt when Heflin later verified it with the U.S. Air Force, only to find that no personnel matched the provided names and ranks. This discovery reinforced the notion that these men were imposters. John Keel, a notable figure in the investigation of paranormal phenomena, became intrinsically linked with the men in black law through his work and was indeed the first to popularize the term men in black in relation to UFO phenomena. His journey into this world was further catalyzed by an incident on December 15, 1966, involving a group of teenagers in West Virginia, which would become a cornerstone in the annals of paranormal encounters. The incident unfolded in a location known as the TNT area, a secluded spot with a history linked to the storage of explosives since World War II. It was here that the teenagers, engaged in typical youthful merriment, were confronted with a terrifying sight. Through the rearview mirror, they witnessed an imposing moth-like entity with glowing eyes, an apparition that would later be known as the Mothman. In a state of panic, the teenagers fled to the nearest police station, where Deputy Millard Halstead documented their account. Despite the outlandish nature of their story, Halstead found their terror to be palpably genuine. These were not children prone to fabrication or exaggeration. Their fear was real and raw. The absence of physical traces only deepened the mystery of what had terrified the teenagers. This encounter and others like it in the West Virginia area, caught the attention of John Keel, who began to delve deeper into these strange sightings. Keel's involvement in investigating such phenomena, including the Mothman and the Men in Black, would later become a significant contribution to the field of paranormal research. 
His work shed light on a world where unexplained sightings, mysterious figures, and encounters with the unknown were more common than previously thought. The Mothman sightings in West Virginia quickly escalated into a phenomenon of significant interest. It was during Keel's investigation into these occurrences that he first encountered the Men in Black. Before his personal encounters, Keel received reports of a woman in black. This unknown woman, often appearing at witnesses' doors and posing as an associate or secretary of Keel's, her deep knowledge of the witnesses' private lives and her insistent questioning unnerved those she visited, leading them to contact Keel with complaints and concerns. In some cases, the MIB's approach deviated from direct questioning about paranormal sightings. Instead, they engaged in peculiar and seemingly trivial interactions, such as urgently requesting a cup of water after knocking on someone's door. The MIB activity in West Virginia, closely intertwined with the Mothman sightings, escalated from peculiar encounters to more disturbing incidents, heightening the sense of fear and unease in the community. One particularly alarming episode involved high schooler Connie Carpenter, who reported a terrifying encounter with a man resembling the MIB on February 22, 1967. Her experience of being nearly abducted and the subsequent threatening note left under her door added a more sinister dimension to the already mysterious MIB phenomenon. While it's possible that this incident was unrelated to the MIB and merely the act of an opportunistic criminal, the timing and context fueled speculations and fears within the community. John Keel, who was deeply involved in investigating the Mothman sightings and related phenomena, also found himself a target of attention from the MIB. His return to New York did not mark the end of his encounters with these figures. Keel reported being followed and monitored by individuals who fit the MIB profile, even in the bustling streets of Manhattan. This ongoing surveillance suggested that the MIB's interest in Keel was not confined to the events in West Virginia, but extended to his overall involvement in paranormal research. A particularly ominous interaction occurred when Keel received a phone call, beckoning him to Long Island for a discussion about his work. The meeting that followed was a direct and intimidating directive for Keel to cease his investigations into the Mothman sightings accompanied by a vague yet menacing threat. In Point Pleasant, West Virginia, the Men in Black encounters continued to escalate, intertwining with UFO sightings and leading to increasingly disturbing experiences for the residents. Among these was the case of a young woman, referred to as Jane Doe, who encountered both a woman in black and a classic MIB named Apoll, in close succession after a UFO sighting. Apol's cryptic behavior, such as asking for water to take pills and then instructing Jane to consume one of the pills, which subsequently caused her to feel dizzy and suffer a migraine, John Keel's analysis of the remaining pills revealed a sulfur compound composition drawing a parallel to the CIA's MK Ultra program and the use of sodium thiopental a sulfur-based truth serum. This connection raised the question of whether the MIB were using similar substances to extract information or control individuals they encountered. Jane's encounter with Apoll, who provided her with forewarnings about future global events and a specific prophecy regarding Bobby Kennedy's assassination, was deeply unsettling especially given the subsequent fulfillment of these predictions. Keel's decision to hypnotically regress Jane for more information led to an even more astonishing development. During the session, Keel found himself communicating not with Jane, but with a Paul, who claimed to be manipulating Jane's vocal cords remotely. This bizarre claim introduced the possibility of a poll being an external entity with the ability to control or influence others, rather than a figment of Jane's imagination or a symptom of a psychological condition. A poll's self-description as being trapped in time and capable of moving between past and future, this claim 
if taken at face value, suggested that Apoll and possibly other MIB entities could be time travelers, a theory that would explain their apparent foreknowledge of future events. Keel's theory of ultra-terrestrials posited that these entities might be beyond the conventional understanding of extraterrestrial or human categories, existing in a realm just outside our normal perception. A case in point is the experience of Mrs. B in Lewis Valley, Colorado, in October 1967. Mrs. B, having recently witnessed a UFO, was confronted by a man dressed in black who had informed about her sighting. His behavior and statements were a mix of odd and seemingly illogical claims. His admission of illiteracy, juxtaposed with his assertion of knowing the contents of any book, and his critique of human food consumption habits suggested an entity with a perspective and understanding vastly different from the norm. The MIB's interest in purchasing Mrs. B's painting of her UFO sighting, followed by the revelation that he had no money, further added to the surreal nature of the encounter. Mrs. B's ability to retain some level of agency, as evidenced by her setting a high price for her artwork, contrasts with the trance-like state she described during most of the visit. This duality of being somewhat aware yet compelled to engage with the MIB's bizarre requests is a common theme in many such encounters. The inability of local authorities to trace the license plate number of the MIB's car, as provided by Mrs. B, only deepened the mystery. The case of Peggy, a UFO investigator working part-time in a department store in Schenectady, New York, further illustrates the bizarre nature of these encounters. A security guard's unexpected approach and claim of being part of a cosmic brotherhood seemed initially like a jest aimed at her interest in UFOs. However, the incident took a turn towards the extraordinary when the guard allegedly emitted rays of light from his eyes causing a co-worker who overheard the conversation to flee in fear and eventually resign from his job. The case of Reverend Martin further illustrates the MIB's alleged influence on individuals' lives. Reverend Martin's sighting of an unusual light performing erratic maneuvers in the sky on Halloween night, followed by a disturbing dream warning him against discussing the UFO, fits into the pattern of psychological manipulation often attributed to the MIB. His subsequent feeling of being watched, even in the sanctuary of his church, suggests a deep psychological impact from the sighting and the dream. The subsequent visit by individuals posing as police officers, initially their demeanor appeared benign and even supportive of Martin's documentation efforts. However, their return visit marked a dramatic and ominous shift in behavior. The aggressive confiscation of the photographs and the subsequent abduction and intimidation of Martin signify a more sinister aspect of these encounters, aligning more closely with the traditional MIB narrative of control and suppression. The menacing conversation overheard by Martin about what to do with his body, although ultimately not acted upon, underscores the profound psychological impact these encounters can have on individuals. The experience of being left in an isolated location, forced to find his own way home, serves as a stark reminder of the potential threat posed by these mysterious entities. The Taylor's encounter on a late night drive in the English countryside in 1972, their story is marked by several classic elements of UFO encounters including radio interference, the sighting of an unusually lit craft, and a feeling of compulsion to approach the object. The presence of the supposed police officers on the Taylor's property without any apparent reason or prior notification is unusual and aligns with the MIB's known pattern of unexpected, uninvited appearances. The aggressive questioning by one of the officers about the previous night's activities despite the Taylor's reluctance to discuss the UFO sighting, further hints at the MIB's characteristic interest in and knowledge of UFO encounters. The rapid response of the police officers the following day, coupled with their apparent prior knowledge of the incident, adds to the mystery, 
The suggestion by these officers that the tailors had merely seen a large tent, dismissing their UFO sighting as a mundane event, a tactic often attributed to the MIB, aimed at debunking or trivializing witnesses' experiences. The police officer's suggestion that the tailors reconsider their story, followed by their unexpected leak of the encounter to the press, led to unwanted media attention and public scrutiny. This intrusion by the media and UFO enthusiasts was further complicated by the arrival of the MIB. Their insistence that Peter not discuss the UFO sighting aligns with their typical objective of suppressing information related to UFO events. However, an intriguing twist occurred when Peter expressed his own desire for privacy, only to be met with the MIB's assurance that they would handle the media. The MIB's ability to effectively disperse the crowd of reporters seemingly exerting influence or control over them adds a layer of mystery to their capabilities. This incident suggests that the MIB possess not only the means to intimidate individual witnesses, but also the power to influence larger groups, further complicating the understanding of their true nature and objectives. The Taylor's story, marked by a series of extraordinary events and interactions with both real and imposter authorities, as well as the MIB, reflects the complex and multifaceted nature of UFO-related phenomena. These encounters raise important questions about the extent of the MIB's influence, their methods of operation, and the implications of their actions for individuals who experience UFO sightings. The encounter between Dr. Herbert Hopkins and the Men in Black in 1976. Dr. Hopkins, a UFO investigator and hypnotherapist, experienced a series of events that typify the mysterious and often disconcerting nature of MIB encounters. The initial phone call from an individual claiming to be a UFO investigator, who promptly appeared at Dr. Hopkins' doorstep almost immediately after the call, defies logical explanation, especially considering the absence of cell phones and nearby payphones at the time. Dr. Hopkins' reaction, despite the bizarre circumstances of the visitor's arrival, is reflective of the Oz factor, a state where individuals find themselves seemingly compelled to engage with the MIB, even when their appearance and behavior are highly unusual. This phenomenon, where normal skepticism or caution is suspended, allows the MIB to gain access to the individuals they target and proceed with their agenda. The visitor's attire was classic MIB, a neatly pressed white dress shirt, black dress pants, a black tie, black suit coat, and the characteristic black fedora. However, the revelation of his hairless pale appearance upon removing the fedora added an otherworldly aspect to his demeanor. The lack of any hair, including eyebrows and eyelashes, and the unusual bright cherry red lips, which later appeared to smudge like makeup, further contributed to the surreal nature of the encounter. The visitor's actions during the conversation, particularly the bizarre demonstration involving the coin, defy conventional explanation. The coin's apparent spontaneous morphing and eventual disappearance could be interpreted as a display of advanced technology, a paranormal occurrence, or a psychological manipulation. The MIB's demonstration with the coin, followed by the statement that the coin would never be seen on this planet again, was perplexing enough. However, the conversation took a darker turn when the MIB referenced Barney Hill, a well-known figure in ufology due to his and his wife's reported alien abduction. The implication that Barney Hill's death was somehow unnatural and linked to the MIB's abilities the MIB's command for Dr. Hopkins to cease his UFO research and destroy his notes, coupled with the threatening insinuation regarding Barney Hill's death, served as a clear attempt at intimidation. The departure of the MIB was as mysterious as his arrival. His complaint about running low on energy, his difficult departure, and his disappearance into a bright light further contribute to the mystique surrounding these entities. Dr. Hopkins' reaction to the encounter, the immediate destruction of his UFO research, and his reluctance to discuss the incident for years, 
underscores the profound psychological impact that MIB encounters can have on individuals. Philip Spencer's encounter on Ilkley Moor in 1987, demonstrating a rare instance where an individual managed to somewhat counteract the MIB's typically overwhelming influence. Spencer's sighting of an alien being and his quick thinking to photograph the creature represent a significant moment in UFO encounter history. His ability to capture photographic evidence marked a pivotal point in his experience. The subsequent appearance of a flying saucer-type craft and its rapid departure only added to the extraordinary nature of the encounter. True to the pattern of MIB interventions following significant UFO sightings, Spencer was visited by individuals claiming to be from the Ministry of Defense. The MIB's interest in Spencer's photograph and their request for the negative highlight their typical objective of controlling or suppressing evidence of UFO encounters. However, Spencer's refusal to hand over the negative and his decision to entrust it to UFO investigator Peter Huff indicates a proactive measure to protect his evidence from potential confiscation. This incident showcases a rare instance where the actions of a witness stymied the MIB's efforts to fully control the narrative and evidence surrounding a UFO sighting. Spencer's foresight in safeguarding the photograph ensured that at least in this case, the MIB were unable to completely suppress physical evidence of an extraterrestrial encounter. Philip Spencer's experience contributes to the broader understanding of MIB activities, suggesting that while they are often successful in their efforts to intimidate and silence witnesses, there are occasions where individuals can, to some extent, resist their influence. The emergence of security footage from a hotel in Niagara Falls, capturing individuals resembling MIB, is a significant development in this narrative, providing rare visual evidence that contributes to the ongoing debate and speculation about their identity and intentions. The MIB's appearance in this footage, seemingly unaware or unconcerned about being recorded, raises questions about their usually meticulous methods of operating without leaving traces. This incident suggests that despite their reputation for control and secrecy, the MIB might not be entirely infallible. Exploring the question of who the MIB are and what they want reveals a range of theories and speculations. Gray Barker's initial portrayal of the MIB as government agents intent on suppressing UFO information has been a prevalent view. Yet internal government memoranda and investigations, such as those following the Rex Heflin case, suggest that at least some government agencies are as in the dark about the MIB as the public. Albert Bender's and John Keel's theories propose a more extraordinary origin for the MIB, with Bender suggesting they are alien beings and Keel positing that they are ultra-terrestrials from another dimension. Keel's theory, in particular, reflects a broader view that the MIB could be part of a phenomenon that transcends conventional understanding of extraterrestrial life, possibly involving interdimensional elements. The range of theories about their origins, from time travelers to manifestations of collective consciousness, reflects the complexity and diversity of ideas surrounding these mysterious figures. The notion that the MIB could be time travelers opens up intriguing possibilities about their knowledge and capabilities. It could explain their apparent foresight and their ability to appear at the right place and time, seemingly aware of events before they happen. Alternatively, the idea that they might be a manifestation of our collective consciousness introduces a psychological or even metaphysical dimension to the phenomenon suggesting that the MIB could be a projection of human fears, beliefs, or subconscious thoughts about the unknown and the unexplained. Despite the extensive speculation and numerous encounters reported over the years, concrete knowledge about the MIB remains elusive. Their ability to maintain this secrecy and the lack of verifiable information about their origins or intentions only add to the aura of mystery that surrounds them.
the MIB's consistent efforts to remain untraceable and their effectiveness in doing so suggest a high level of sophistication and purpose in their actions. The ongoing intrigue and debate surrounding the MIB ensure that they remain a prominent and compelling subject in the study of unexplained phenomena. As new encounters are reported and new theories are proposed, the mystery of who the MIB are and what they want continues to captivate the imagination and provoke inquiry.